Good afternoon, everybody. This is a live severe weather briefing. And today I'm going to be focusing on the severe weather threat that could evolve across Dixie Alley during the middle of next week. It looks like especially Tuesday night through Wednesday, there could be a substantial mid-latitude cyclone that's going to eject from the southern Rockies across the deep south. And at least the European model shows a pretty substantial tornado outbreak potential. The GFS shows a little bit of an earlier shearing out of that upper level system over an anti-cyclone or a large ridge that's gonna be entrenched across the subtropics to the south of Florida. And uh, also uh, the timing of a system that is right behind it and the interaction of those two and its development into an open wave and even uh, potentially attaining a positive tilt across its ejection across Dixie Alley, Dixie Alley could lead to uh, the potential for even an outbreak of severe weather but still it's quite a few days out this would be tuesday night into wednesday and it looks like the earliest that severe weather could develop is across eastern texas across eastern texas by uh, tuesday night uh, possibly northeast texas shreveport southwestern arkansas could be under the gun a surface low is going to develop across central texas and eject off to the northeast and uh, enhanced wind shear right along that surface low track and also off to its south. If the European uh, model is the one that you believe that on Wednesday, a low level jet approaching 70 knots is going to dominate that warm sector. And for that reason, all hazards of severe weather could be possible on Wednesday, developing first Tuesday night and uh, continuing overnight Tuesday. And then uh, during the day on Wednesday from Mississippi into Alabama, it looks like. But again, the GFS model shows a much earlier uh, shearing out of that upper level system and uh, definitely not as substantial as a severe weather event. So we'll just have to see which model has a better handle on it. I personally think that the European has a better handle and I'll talk about why in a little bit as I break down these forecast models on the PivotalWeather.com website, which is an incredible website to look at that, those high resolution European uh, out, uh, model outputs. And also the forecast soundings on the European, and I'll break down some of the hodographs that we could see in Dixie Alley as well. But first I want to show you some radar of a nice lake effect snow plume downwind of Lake Ontario, uh, hammering the Tug Hill Plateau and the Lowville areas. I've heard of uh, many reports of low road closures out here. And uh, this is uh, one where there's strong winds blowing over the lake as well. You can see with the cellular connection, uh, the winds are still strong and there's some vertical wind shear that is causing this break, uh, band to break up into individual convective elements. And then when you get a little bit uh, further inland, uh, that's when it starts to consolidate into more of a, uh, a, a, a a steady lake effect snow plume. But whenever you see the cellular convection like that coming off the lake, that's a sign that there is vertical wind shear uh, that's present and it's uh, breaking up that band into individual convective elements that are racing uh, along and there's blizzard conditions, blizzard warnings uh, throughout this area to the north of Syracuse, not into Syracuse, it's just windy with some snow flurries, occasional snow squalls here and there. But the Tug Hill Plateau to the south of Watertown is just getting dominated. And it's been a very below normal season for lake effect and including uh, snowfall across the Tug Hill Plateau, which gets more snow uh, than most places throughout the world, uh, usually three to 400 inches of snow, even more than that across the Tug Hill Plateau, but this year well below normal. But for that reason, because it's been so warm this winter, the lake waters are wide open, open for business. Even this late in the season, normally the lakes are completely frozen over and that shuts down the lake effect snow machine. But in this case, there's wide open lake waters upstream, very cold air coming over uh, the lake parallel to its main axis. So this is a perfect event for the Tug Hill Plateau to get hammered by three to four feet of snow. But my eyes are on Dixie Alley next week. I've got a case of frostbite, as you can see here, starting to heal. I'm just waiting for that to scab and then peel off. But for that reason, I didn't want to fly into this lake effect snow zone and expose my skin uh, to, to more damage. Uh, so I'm focusing on Dixie Alley, trying to pace myself just a little bit. And I'm going to break down the evolution of the parent trough that's going to lead to that severe weather first in the european and then i'm going to show you uh, the gfs model and this is the second system right here that's going to be entering the pacific northwest behind the parent system or the lead storm system both of these systems are over the north pacific ocean right now uh, heading off to the east and then they'll dive south like this one as it interacts with the energized subtropical jet stream and then depending on if the system gets cut off 
and then the main polar front jet stream kind of leaves it behind and then it uh, more quickly shears out over top this anti-cyclone across the subtropics to the south of Florida. If that scenario happens, then it's going to be more of a rainmaker, less of a severe weather threat. But right now, the European shows an interaction of the second system and the lead system quite favorably to lead to an open wave that even gains, gains a negative tilt when it ejects on the night of the third. Here you can see the trough axis here with a slight positive tilt. You've got this kicker system back behind it that's coming in. Eventually, they'll merge into one open wave that will eject on March 4th across Dixie Alley with the potential of big-time severe weather. And you can see here that the system is attempting to cut off. And normally with all the flow on the east side of the trough like this, it's no longer digging to the south into northern Mexico. But in this case, you've got a system right behind it that's almost acting to increase the flow on the back side of this trough, dig it even more and turn it into an open wave as it ejects across Dixie Alley. But still, with this anti-cyclone across the subtropics, this trough digging south into northern Mexico. This is going to excite a strong low-level jet about a kilometer above the ground uh, just ahead of this system because of those pressure differences. And it's that low-level jet that the European accelerates above 70 knots on March 4th. And here you can see a really potent trough axis You've got flow on the backside from the kicker system as these are joining forces to create a more open wave that's going to surge across Dixie Alley and have a prolific low-level jet ahead of it. And now this trough axis by this time, which is midnight, the night of March 3rd, the night of Super Tuesday, is more of a neutral tilt. And then I step six hours uh, forward to Wednesday morning and then the thing gains a negative tilt. So as we've discussed during these severe weather briefings many times leading up to this, Whenever a trough is going from a positive tilt to a negative tilt like this, it's intensifying. You have more difluence aloft downstream. Uh, you have a more backed, southerly, low-level jet. You have more southeasterly surface winds, and you still have those southwesterlies aloft. And that leads to a, a scenario that could even be a tornado outbreak potential. But you can see just how complicated the evolution of this trough is. You've got this kicker system back behind it. You've got the transition to a negative tilt. That's all happening on the mesoscale down here within uh, the synoptic scale trough and uh, the evolution of that uh, uh, low-level jet on ahead of it and the track of the surface low still is going to change dramatically between now and then. Uh, but since I'm not chasing a lake effect, I might as well talk about this anyway. And on 18Z, this is when the system peaks. Look at now, it's an open wave. You've got a lot of flow on the backside that is causing this system to even dig a little bit more when it should be shearing out. But it's that system back behind it that's going to lead to this system to gain this uh, favorable open wave shape. Uh, look at this uh, uh, low-level jet downstream when I go over to 850 millibars or a kilometer above the ground. You've got a low-level jet near 70 knots, even into the low 70s there. If you get a surface space storm in this environment, it's going to spin and probably produce a big-time tornado. But again, as I mentioned, the GFS shows a very different scenario evolving. But this would be March 4th at about 1 p.m. Eastern time, and you've got upper 60s to near 70 dew points uh, across the entire state of Alabama. Coincident with that 70 knot low level jet and very strong low level shear, the nose of that instability axis could even poke into central Tennessee there. But this is a big time instability area here uh, across Alabama, strong low level jet. Let's look at the position of the surface low, drilling down to the surface. Again, this is on the Pivotal Weather website. You basically got a heart shaped surface low feature that extends down into northern Alabama with that low level jet going all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. But that surface low track will also likely have a tornado threat with it. That right now the European has it tracking through Tennessee up toward the Ohio River Valley. I do think that the tornado threat could uh, spread east into Georgia, even portions of the Carolinas here. But as I mentioned, the uh, GFS shows a different evolution of that upper system, one that I don't think is as believable. So let's pick up a forecast sounding, even though this is way in advance and it's really reckless to be doing this this far in advance, we might as well. This is in northern Alabama. Here you can see the hodograph. I'm going to get rid of my head really quick. So you can see the hodo. There it is in the upper right portion of the screen. You can see the low-level jet a kilometer above the ground, south-southwest, near 70 knots up there. Your surface wind is only 20 knots out of the due south. 
That creates nearly 50 knots of shear between the surface and one kilometer above the ground. Then you've got all these strong winds aloft as well, leading to storm motions that are going to be like 60 miles an hour. In fact, this one shows a 70 knot uh, storm motion in northern Alabama. Those are flying. You're not going to be able to keep up with individual storms. So you'll have one shot to intercept the storm and have to drop down the line and intercept those because those are... Un unpractical storm motions out there to really keep up with any individual storm but there are usually more storms within Dixie Alley 70 knots just above the ground surface wind 20 knots critical angle is only 40 degrees up there so it, with more of a right mover than you would have what's called a perfect totograph uh, but in this case uh, with such a long 0 to 1 kilometer shear vector of 50 knots uh, traditionally in the central and eastern U.S. you can have shallower critical angles and still have that strong tornado threat out there. Let's look at a sounding just a little bit further south near the Montgomery, Alabama area. Still same textbook photograph for even a strong tornado threat there. But again as I mentioned the GFS is a lot different. I'm going to pop over here on the low level jet on the GFS and look at that at 18Z. That's a veered out low level jet south west to northeast a very positively tilted trough axis at this time so obviously the upper levels have to look a lot different on the gfs i look over at the gfs and look at this this system is a cutoff low over east texas with the main jet stream leaving it behind choking it off in north, northern mexico drastically different evolution than the european model but i think that it's going to become an open wave uh, with the, the second system here becoming uh, the strong flow on the back side of that system. The European has had that evolution now three model runs in a row. The 0Z and the 6Z GFS had that solution. And this one's kind of an outlier here uh, according to the 12Z GFS. Let's look at the 18Z GFS and see if it wobbled back at all. It does look like the GFS has wobbled back just a bit. This is at 18Z, but it's a faster solution. So it does become an open wave with that secondary system becoming the flow on the backside. But a much faster storm system than what the European is showing. The GFS is showing more of a Tuesday night nocturnal type of an event. But it has trended back toward the European from the 12Z to the 18Z runs. So I suspect that when we get to the 0Z runs tonight, uh, the GFS and the European are likely going to be in agreement. But just something to watch, it's this time of year, uh, looking at the very long range models, it does look like uh, it's going to quiet down for about 10 to 14 days after this event. And then there are some signals that show that last week of March uh, is really when uh, tornado season is going to ramp up across the eastern Great Plains, central U.S. and southern U.S., especially toward the end of March into early April. So certainly stay tuned. And if you're interested in uh, daily extreme weather briefings like this, I do them every day or live streaming, please consider following the Facebook supporter profile that I've linked on this live stream. I'm going to use that to support uh, live uh, storm chasing throughout the year and to deliver educational briefings such as this. And thank you to the PivotalWeather.com guys. Uh, for allowing me to use uh, this model imagery. It's an incredible website uh, to, to look at the different models, the different model output, and uh, learn a lot about meteorology and take what you learned from these briefings and apply it yourself uh, to the numerical weather prediction. So thank you, everybody. Have a great Thursday evening. I'm going to make a beef stew in my instant pot. Uh, pretty excited about that. It's going to be packed with fiber, and I'm going to continue to reload the model imagery as we get closer to zero Z. Never stop chasing.